أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العادون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الهمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن الذي ليس لصفته حد محدود ولا نعت موجود ولا وقت معدود ولا أجل ممدود أما بعد فقد قال الله الحكيم في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم تتجافى جنوبهم عن المضاجع يدعون ربهم خوفا وطمعا ومما رزقناهم ينفقون فلا تعلم نفس ما أخفي لهم من قرة أعين جزاء بما كانوا يعملون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات for the love of our beloved Prophet and his beloved progeny, a second loud salawat. For the hastening in the return of our beloved 12th Imam, a third final loud salawat. Yesterday we touched on the benefits of dua that come along with the very core fundamental reason why we pray. The most fundamental reason why we pray is to build that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to show and manifest our neediness to Him. This is part of the reason why when you and I supplicate, we are recommended to have our hands open and towards the skies because it shows our neediness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But alongside this fundamental reason why we pray, we said there are other benefits as well. The response to our hajat and our requests and our du'as is part of those benefits. The fact that it revives my heart is part of those benefits. The fact that when I pray, the doors of other blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open up onto me is another one of those benefits. And of course, maybe the most important of all of those benefits that come along with du'a is that there are times where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for something to happen to me. For whatever reason, it may not be the best of events or developments. And with my du'a, I have the ability to change the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said that when we talk about changing God's decree, in the reality of the matter, there's two types of decree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. You might have heard before that every one of us has two different types of ajal. There's a type of ajal where you have to leave this world no matter what you do. This is definitive. And then you have the type of ajal where it can be delayed and it can be postponed based on the type of actions that you do. Therefore, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a particular matter has a conditional will, it's a terminology that's not philosophical just for us to be able to understand it better. If I do my dua, then that can potentially change the outcome of this situation. But beyond all of this, we said, what is the most fundamental and foundational way and condition for my dua to be heard? The most foundational condition is what you find in multiple verses of the Quran. And that is that when I do my dua and supplication, I have to call on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself and him only. I can't be approaching dua from the angle of there are 10 people who can solve my problem. God is number 10. I'll ask nine people first. 
Once we are stuck and we have no one else to solve this problem, then I'll go to the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Though practically that is what happens to you and I, Quran and Hadith is telling us that's not the right understanding. You're not supposed to put God beside the other solutions. He's above all the other solutions. If any other solutions come your way, it's coming through Him. That's the proper way to look at it. And hence, the verse of the Quran said, أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُثْتَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ when is who is going to respond to the call of the distressed one? When he calls upon him. If this distressed person comes and he recites in beautiful voice and he begs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but deep down his hope is in something else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this condition has not been fulfilled. This is roughly where we ended our discussion yesterday. Tonight, inshallah, we'll continue with this discussion by posing the following questions. Number one. What are the etiquette of dua and the manners I'm supposed to keep in mind when I begin to utter and pronounce the words in my dua? Number two, what are we taught to, why are we taught to recite salawat before we begin our dua and then again after we are done with our dua for the acceptance of our dua? What's the wisdom behind this? Number three, does it matter what names of God I invoke when I do my dua? Are there secrets in the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how they tie into particular hajat that I have? Or does it not matter what name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I call upon? And what did the sixth imam tell his companion when he began to change some of the names in the dua that he had taught him? Number four, what are the different categories of individuals who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a green light and a free pass when it comes to their dua being accepted. And number five, and finally, if I call on Allah and I don't see an answer to my dua, doesn't seem like my situation changed much, does it mean my dua was not heard? And what did the eighth Imam tell his companion, Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Nasr al Bazanti, when he started to have doubts because he was praying so much for a haja? but could not see the manifest response to his dua in his day-to-day -day life. Tonight, inshallah, we'll delve into these five questions with a loud salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allah salam I know the sister side is already almost full to the end. So if we can, before I get into the topic, if we can all please move forward. A loud salawat, please. And the brothers too, please. Allahumma salana Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala Jid Fajr. Another loud salawat. Allahumma salana Muhammad wa ala Jid Fajr. The third with the loudest of your voices. When I begin my dua, there's particular etiquette and manners that are recommended for me to take into consideration. There were etiquette that I was supposed to do before I even start saying anything in my dua. We covered some of them yesterday. Of those was that first of all, you are to face the qibla. Second of them, for example, was to do wudu. The third of them was to do a two rakat salat before you even ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything. And I want to emphasize as a disclaimer, these are etiquettes. And as you'll see, there are many of them. And this doesn't mean every time I want to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have to go and have all of this etiquette at the same time. That doesn't seem to be what the Ahl Bayt are teaching us. What the Ahl Bayt are teaching us is that there are many etiquettes. You have to try to gather as many of them that is possible for you. The more, the better in this dua that you do. When I start to recite my dua, first and foremost, and this goes without saying, is that I have to begin with Bismillah. A dua that starts without Bismillah, then obviously that's a problem. That, I think that's very clear from what we're taught from when we are growing up. This is the first of those etiquettes. The second of those etiquettes is before I get to asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of my haja and my request is that I am supposed to do thana of him. I'm supposed to praise him. Now, 
Growing up, sometimes you hear this kind of stuff from your parents or in the masjid and you wonder to yourself, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in need of us sitting there and praising Him and telling Him how great He is? And no, this is not for Him. This is for you. Because the condition for the acceptance of your dua was to only call on Him, yes? Well, if you praise Him, and a part of that praise is a reminder that he's the one who decides everything in this world, you're giving yourself a better chance and a better opportunity of truly calling on him. And this is why the companion of the sixth Imam, Al-Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Muhammad ibn Muslim, he came to the sixth Imam, he said, how should I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before I start my dua? When you look in the narrations, there are different terminology, different wordings about how you can praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This one is a beautiful one. He said, Muhammad, before you start with your dua, before you even ask for anything, praise him and praise him like this. Say, ya man huwa aqrabu ilayya min hablil wareed. Oh, the one who's closer to me than my own veins in my body. Ya man huwa fa'alun lima yureed. Oh, the one who does as he wishes. So when you recite this dua before you actually start your supplication, what happens? You know everything is in hands' hands. You're not thinking about this person maybe can solve my problem, that thing can solve my problem. No, no, no. Who's, he is fa'alun lima yureed. He's the one who decides everything. He said, say this, Ya man yahulu bayna al-mar'i wa qalbi. Oh, the one who comes between a person and his heart. See, normally, a person and his heart, we would consider these two to be the same thing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, I come between a man and his heart, meaning even what's running through his heart, I have the ability to flip his heart, to change his heart. This is in my hands. He said, Muhammad, say this, Ya man huwa bil mandhar al-a'la, O the one who looks down upon us. Ya man huwa laysa ka mithlihi shay. O the one who there is no one or nothing like him. Then you can start your dua. Did that change the dynamics of this dua? That changed the dynamics of this dua. This is the second etiquette. Moving on. He said, the next thing you should do is you should recite salawat. Allahumma salla ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Hence, you find the narration from the Prophet. He said, when you want to do your dua, put a salawat at the beginning and then put a salawat at the end because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never accept the first requests and accept the end of the request without accepting the haja that you have placed between these two salawats. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us at the beginning. He will accept that dua, definitely. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us at the end. He will... Accept that dua definitely. Whatever you put in between, that is your own personal matter and haja, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not reject that anymore. That's number three. Number four, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of his special servants and by the right of the Quran. This a'mal that we do on this night is specifically under these narrations. The Imam said, when you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the right of the Quran, put the Quran in front of you and say, Oh Allah, I ask you by the right of this Quran, wa bihaqqi man arsaltahu bih, and the rest of the dua that we recite during these nights. This is number four. Number five of those etiquettes of dua is that you utilize the special names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we understand from narrations is that the type of name that you invoke when you're asking for your haja makes a difference in terms of how my dua is heard. This is what we understand from narrations. If I'm asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for rizq and sustenance, it's better for me to call on him as Ya Raziq. If I'm asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, it's better for me to call upon him as Ghafoor and Rahim. If I'm asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for knowledge, it's better for me to ask based on that adjective of his, and so on and so forth. You might sit there and say, but Shaykh, this is very difficult. I don't know all these connections and all these secrets. Well, wonderful. Because Shaykh doesn't know all these secrets either. But you know who does know these secrets? The Ahl Bayt know these secrets. And that is why they have legislated for us packages of dua. And you find in the seerah of the Ahl Bayt, they were a little sensitive on try not to change this package that we gave to you. It's okay. If you really feel like doing something a little different, that's okay. It's not the end of the world. But try your best to stick to this package. So the sixth Imam, Al Imam al Sadiq, salawatullahi wa 
he told his companion, listen, when the time of ghaibah comes, he was talking about you and I. He said, when the time of ghaibah comes, your imam is not going to be amongst you anymore. You're going to feel lost. You're going to feel lonely. And only those will survive at that time who recite the dua of al gharik the dua of the one who's drowning. Now, obviously, this is not a person who's actually drowning. It means he's so distressed, it feels as if he's drowning. Said the one, man da'a bi dua il gharik Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold his hand. So the companion asked the sixth imam, he said, so what is this dua? Can you share it with me? Very short. We're very familiar with this dua actually. He said, you say, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Muqallib Al-Qulub, Thabbit Qalbi Ala Deenik. He said, you cite this dua during the time of ghaibah. So Abdullah ibn Sanan, companion of the sixth Imam said, perfect. He raises his hand and says, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Ya Muqallib Al-Qulub, Wal Absar, Thabbit Qalbi Ala Deenik. And the sixth Imam said, oh, oh, wait a second. You added something there. He said, yeah, I said, Muqallib al qulub wal absar He said, Allah is Muqallib al qulub wal absar What you did is not wrong, but try to stick to the package I gave to you. Try to stick to the terminology I gave to you. Why? Because there's secrets in these. Yes, it's best. Sometimes you may not want to recite a dua that's given by the Ahl Bayt. Maybe you just want to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is completely fine. Don't let this stop you from just opening up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But include some of the duas that were legislated as packages as well. This dua, Ya Ali, Ya Adim, all these duas, they have secrets in them. He said, Abdullah, Allah is muqallib al ghulub wal absar but recite the dua it's better to do it the way i told you just say ya muqallib al ghulub thabbit qalbi ala dinik the names of allah and how they connect with the haja that you are requesting they have secrets in them we don't have to worry about this too much because we have those individuals who speak to us from behind the curtain of ghaib they have already done this job for us. This is the fifth of those etiquette, number six, and one of the most important etiquette of all, is that when you come and you do dua, you do it with humility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, there are those, they wake up in the middle of the night, you know what they do? They pray to their Lord, they have a little bit of fear in their heart. Have a little bit of fear in their heart means what? They pray with hope on one hand because they're hoping that their dua is responded to. They're hoping their haja is going to be given to them. Right? That's why we always come to dua with hope. But he said they also have khawfan. Khawf is what? I bring that humility. I'm the one who's coming with a whole package of sins. I'm the one who's technically not worthy of being here. I'm the one who technically is not worthy of addressing you. Now, you're gracious, you're kind, but I have to understand who I am. The Imam said, you come with a little bit of humility. Yes? And there's a famous marja, I don't want to mention his name. He has a very beautiful line, a very beautiful observation. He says, I have gone through all of these narrations that we have on the idea of when you can become a guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says there's only two to three times in total where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this person is my guest. What are those times? One of them is when you enter into the month of Ramadan. You have entered into the Yafatullah. Yes, you're the guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second of those times is when you go for Hajj. The narration says these individuals are dhuyuf rahman They are the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third time that you might be able to add to this is when you go and visit an ill person, an ill believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's like you came and visited me. Three times. You can go and become the guest of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the scholar said, there's only one time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to you. There's only one time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and visits your heart. When is that? That is when you raise your hands and you pray with a broken heart. It's when the narration says, I am with those whose hearts are broken. That means they come and pray, but they pray with a humility. Why are their hearts broken? It could be for a lot of different things. Maybe I come, my heart is broken because I know how many times I've broken my promise. 
Other person comes, his heart is broken because he feels like he's stuck. He doesn't have anywhere else to go. Other person is stuck with a particular hajat that he wants. Another person is in a very severe difficulty. At the end of the day, come with a broken heart. And when you come with a broken heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will visit that heart. That's why one of my, the most beautiful narrations I've ever heard that's attributed to our holy prophet Muhammad al-Mustafa They asked him a simple question. They said, Ain Allah, where is God? Where can we find God? And the prophet said, if you want to find God, go and find a broken heart. You will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there. The etiquette, the sixth of those etiquette, is praying with what? With humility when I come to the door of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us move on to the seventh of those etiquette, a loud salawat, and let's please move forward again. Allah <laughs> A second salawat. Allah. A third final salawat. Allah. Of the next etiquette is to see in the midst of your dua, is it possible for you to shed some tears? This is etiquette. If I don't feel like crying, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. But this is etiquette. Why? Because the Imam told his companion, he said, listen, sometimes when you do dua, and then your heart becomes raqiq, it feels soft. And tears start to flow from your eyes. So pay attention. Because he's looking at you right now. There's a special attention on you right now when the tears come. And the companion asked the Imam, he said, sometimes I do dua, I'm not, I can't even get myself to cry in my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes? But I can think of something else that might be a bit sad and that you know, will bring tears to my eyes. Maybe I've lost a loved one and that will bring tears to my eyes. The Imam told him, even if it's that, even if it's that, do that. Because when you start to cry, this heart is soft, that's a very special moment, yes? This is the seventh of those etiquette. Number eight, he said, recite your dua with a low voice, especially when you're by yourself. Sometimes you're in the full jama'ah, you have many people in front of you, you're all reciting with a loud voice. That has its own benefit. We will get to that momentarily. If you're by yourself, a little voice. Yes, that's also a sign of humility. Number nine, when you come and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your dua, don't ask for small things, ask for major things. Don't underestimate his grace. He likes it when you don't underestimate your, his grace. When I say he likes it, I whisper this part, yes? When he says he likes it, it means it's more beneficial for you. I keep saying he likes this and he likes that. It just means it has a better impact on who? On you. Just always remember that. He's liking and not liking is a separate discussion. Better impact on you. Come and ask him for major things. So the narration says the Prophet, when people used to come and ask him for things, he never said no. If he could respond to the request of that person, he would respond to the request of that person. If he couldn't, he would remain quiet. This was part of his manners. He didn't want to turn around to the person and reject them. So this Bedouin came to the Prophet. He said, I, I want to ask you for a request. He said, go ahead, ask me. He said, I want uh, a ride, a horse, a donkey, something to ride, a camel. He has to use it for my day-to-day -day life. Yes. The Prophet said, okay, done, ask. He said, I also want some help for my finances and my costs and so on and so forth. He said, okay, I'll help you with that too. Ask, he was hoping for him to ask for something bigger, greater, more special. These are not bad, these are good. Something even greater. He asked for the third thing too, it was day-to-day -day business. Then the Prophet told him, you can have all of these things from me, no problem. Then he left. He said, how much of a big difference is there between this man and the old lady of Bani Israel? Oh. So his companion said, what, this old lady of Bani Israel, you're talking about, what's the story of this old lady? 
said when Musa alayhi salam, as part of the exodus, he was taking his people, saving his people from Fir'aun, on the way, they came to a point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa, the bones of Yusuf are in this area. You have to find these bones and take them with you so that you can bury them in somewhere proper, somewhere appropriate. And Musa said, Ya Allah, I don't know where these bones are. I don't know where the body of my brother Musa is or my brother Yusuf is. How am I supposed to find out? He said, amongst this qawm of Bani Israel, amongst these people, there is somebody who knows. Go and ask them. Musa came to Bani Israel and he said, who knows where the bones of Yusuf are? Everyone pointed to this old lady. So Musa, I should picture this. Musa came with all of his, you know, might and his status and all of this. He came to this old lady and said, can you help us out? She said, I can definitely help you out, but I have a condition. He said, what's your condition? She said, I need you to guarantee for me that I will enter into heaven. But that's not all. I want to be your neighbor too. I want to be in heaven at the same daraja as you. And Musa said, can't we just stop at the heaven part? Can't we just say you'll be in heaven too? For Musa, this was too much. And revelation came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa, when my servant asks for something great, don't cut down his haja. He's dealing with me. She's dealing with me. What she asked for, she has a responded dua with me. Whatever she's asking for, tell her she's going to get it. Musa said, you have it. This is the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of those etiquette is to always ask for major things. Number nine is to insist on your dua. You prayed. The answer of your dua, you don't see it clearly. It's okay. Come back and insist. Come back and pray again. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this? Why does he want us to come back and insist on our dua? Tomorrow night we'll talk about that inshallah. Insisting on your dua doesn't mean you get angry with God. That's a bad thing. Insisting on your dua, it says you come back and show your neediness again. Oh Allah, I don't have it yet, if you could please. Multiple times. It doesn't matter. Insisting is a positive trait when it comes to dua. We'll move on to number 10. Go to sajda when you do your dua. Go down to sajda. Number 11. Find the best of places to supplicate. One of the best places to supplicate is in a masjid. One of the best places to supplicate is in the shrines of the ma'asumin and so on and so forth. Next one, find the best of times to supplicate. One of the best times to supplicate, of course, is when? Is the nights of Qadr. Tonight's our nights. This is our opportunity. Of the next etiquette, yes, is to raise your hands when you do your dua. Because the narration says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala feels ashamed to send away someone when they raise their hands. Yes? Doesn't want to turn them away. These are all of the etiquettes. Okay, and then there is that category of individuals who have a responded dua to with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have an answered dua with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already. It's almost like as if God already gave them one dua coupon already they have. Who are these individuals? These are separate. You and I have to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, get everything right, hopefully try to get as many of the etiquette as we can, so on. The narrations say there are those, it's almost as if we already have guaranteed, responded dua with them. Who are they? Number one, the ill, those who are sick. So this one, his back hurts. That one, he can't even come to the majlis. This one, his, his body is giving him a hard time. All of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a, a responded dua with the ill person, with the sick person. Number two, the one who goes and visits the ill person. He has a dua with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His dua is going to be heard. It's not going to be rejected. Number three, the one who prays for others. So before he sits there and says, Oh Allah, I have this haja. Before he even gets to that, he says, Oh Allah, I have a brother, I have a sister, they have this haja. And I don't want to use this terminology, but I'll do it anyways. This is that game you can play with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is that cheat code you can utilize with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the narration says, when this person prays, and he first brings up what? The needs of his brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to the angels 
and says, did you hear my servant praying for his brother or sister, especially when they're not around? Did you hear him praying for others? Whatever he prayed for others, twice as much, give it to himself. Praying for others, you have a responded dua already, a dua that's guaranteed already. The next of those individuals are parents. The dua of parents. Good side and bad side. Yes, God forbid bad side, on the good side as well. One more loud salawat and the sisters can please move forward. Thank you. Allahumma salallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad. As much as possible. A second salawat. A third final loud salawat. Of those du'as that is guaranteed also is when people come together and they pray together. The narration says three sometimes. The narration says sometimes four. If they come together and they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the same thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants it to them. Like these du'as we do during these nights. This is definitely heard by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last of those who has a guaranteed du'a with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is oppressed. You see what's happening today in Gaza and other parts of the world? Every cry of every child in that part of the world it shakes the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears these du'as. And the narration says, when the mazloom prays, when the oppressed prays, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَأَنصُرَنَّ لَكَ I will make you victorious. عَاجِلًا أَمْ عَاجِلًا Either sooner or later, but I will do this. And sometimes the oppressed is not outside of our house, it's inside of our house. We have to be careful. Sometimes the oppressor is my child. Sometimes the oppressor is my wife. Sometimes the oppressor is my husband. Sometimes the oppressors are my own parents. If I break their heart, if I disrespect them, they have a guaranteed dua with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is scary. Now, these individuals when they pray, or if I pray, and I pray with as many etiquettes as I possibly can. Shaykh, I'm doing the whole thing with the proper package, yes? If I come and do dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is my dua definitely going to be heard if you prayed with that main condition? It's not my promise. It's the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is definitely going to be heard. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hearing a dua and how he decides to respond to the dua, two completely different things. Equating these two with one another opens a can of worms. In the du'a, he said, أَمَّا يُجِيبُ الْمُضْتَرَّ da'a." Who's going to respond to the distressed one when he calls him? Did he say how he was going to respond? Did he say he was going to give you exactly what you're asking for? No. This part is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you can be sure about if you do it with that main condition is my du'a is heard. Even if seemingly nothing seems to change around you. And this is why companion of the 8th Imam, Al-Imam Al-Rida, Salawatullahi wa salamu He came to the 8th Imam, he said, Ya Abu Al-Hasan, I have a problem. So what's your problem? This was a famous companion, yes? Bazanti, famous companion. He said, I have a problem. He said, Oh Ahmad, what's your problem? He said, my problem is I've had a haja for many years. And da'utullah, I've called on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for years and years, but I haven't seen any responses to my dua. Dakhala fi qalbi shay. Now doubt is starting to make its way into my heart. What did the Imam say? The Imam said, That doubt is coming from shaitan. Don't let that doubt come into your heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has definitely heard your dua. And then the Imam said this. He said, oh Ahmad, if I came to you one day and I told you that when you prayed the other day, the other night, that your dua was definitely heard, if I as your imam tell you this, would you take it? Would you believe it? He said, ya ibn Rasulullah, of course, if I had a guarantee of someone like you, of course I would take it. Your hujjatullahi ala khalqa, your God's proof upon his people. 
Of course, if you gave me that guarantee, I would take it. Then the eighth Imam said, Fakun billahi awthaq. Didn't God already give you that guarantee? Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already promise to you that when you call on him, your dua is heard? He already said, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ He said, if you have trust in my promise, have more trust in the promise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to you. So when we pray and we don't see any changes, that means maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided to respond to my dua in a different way. What are the different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to respond to our dua? Tomorrow night, inshallah, we'll go into detail on that topic. And this is why you find in the lives of the ma'asumin, the life of the fourth imam who maybe prayed the most, still life was very difficult for him. And of those who prayed constantly and still life came with its calamities was the man who will leave this world on a night like this. Sallallahu alayka ya Ali ibn Abi Talib. Sallallahu alayka ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. Let us take our hearts to the city of Kufa. The city that was busy one day. It was a city of coming and going. And now the city has all turned dark. And Ali, brothers and sisters, is very much ready to leave this world. The amount of betrayal the amount of difficulty that Ali has gone through, the amount of accusations he's had to deal with. At this point, he raises his hand and says, Oh Allah, I've had enough with these people. Take me away from these people. Give them a different imam. They don't want me anymore. They want to reject me. Ali has been ready to leave this world for a long time. And now the final days of his life have arrived. The narration says people gathered around the house and around the door of the house of Ali. And they saw that Imam al Hassan came out of this house. He saw this group that had gathered. He turned to them. He said, my companions, please leave. Ali is in such a painful state right now. Your Amir al muminin is in such a difficult situation right now. He cannot meet with any of you. He cannot see any of you. The group began to disperse. Asbagh ibn Nubata says, I stayed. I had to see Ali ibn Abi Talib one more time before he left this world. He said, I stayed. As much as Imam al Hassan asked me to leave, I said, I cannot live with myself if I don't see Ali ibn Abi Talib one more time. I have to stay and see him. Finally, I was given permission. He says, I entered into the house and I saw this warrior who at times could move the gate of Khaybar. Now he is lying on his own deathbed. His body is melting away and his face has gone completely pale and the blood from his head is still trickling down on his forehead. When I saw this, the moment I saw it, tears started to roll down my eyes. I couldn't control myself anymore. Is this the same Ali who was that brave warrior? Is this the same Ali who every Every night used to take food for all of the orphans. Now he can't even carry his own body. Now he can't even take care of his own affairs. Asbah says, I came and I threw myself on the body of Ali. And I started to kiss his hands. And I began to cry. And Ali said, oh Asbah, don't worry. فَإِنَّهَا وَاللَّهَ الْجَنَّةِ My path, inshallah, is towards heaven. This difficulty I find on my way is fine. There's just a little bit left until I can make my way towards the final heaven that I want to go towards. And Asbagh begins to leave. Then the family gathers around Ali. And Ali begins to make his final wasiyah. He said, Allah, Allah fil aytam, take care of the orphans after me. Allah, Allah fil salah, take care of your prayer after me. Allah, Allah fil Quran, remember the Quran after me. Until those final moments came where they saw all of a sudden and the words of Ali became slower and slower. The energy has left his body. That enthusiasm has left his body until the final moment came where Ali was not breathing anymore. And all of a sudden, this family all says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Imagine what happened to the heart of these children on that night. We tell you, Ali, oh Ali, at least on a night like this, you had your family around you. On the 10th of Muharram, your grandson, Ali and Al-Akbar, will go towards the battlefield. His father won't even be able to sit with him in those final moments. Only the different parts of his body, his father will be able to bring back to the tents. What happened on the 10th of Muharram? Ali and Al-Akbar came to the tent. The narration says Hussein began to cry. The tears started to fall from his eyes. He knew exactly why Ali and Al-Akbar had come. 
The moment Ali came, he gave him permission quickly. Ya Ali, go faster. Don't do this to my heart too much. Don't put too much pain in my heart. They say he gave him permission very quickly. And he said, before you go, you have to go to the tent of the women and the children. You have to ask them for forgiveness. You have to ask them for your final farewell. Ali and Al-Akbar came into this tent. All I'll tell you is that these women and children, some of them started to pull on the clothes of Ali and Al-Akbar. Some of them said, oh Ali, don't leave us here in the middle of nowhere. Take us back to Medina where we have protection. Ali and Al-Akbar went to the battlefield. He fought, he came back to his father. He uttered a line. This line put so much pain in the heart of his father. He said, my father, the thirst is too much. I can't take this thirst anymore. The weightiness of the army is too much for me. The armor is too heavy for me. My father, any water. And Hussein looked at him with no hope in his eyes. He said, Ali, go back. Your grandfather will quench your thirst very soon. Ali went back to the battlefield. He struck on the head and he fell down on the ground and he called, Ya Aba, my father, come. They say Hussein ran faster than he had ever run on the 10th of Muharram. Then all of a sudden they saw he had put his cheek on the cheek of Ali and Al Akbar and he kept saying, Ya Ali, ala dunya ba'daka al -afa. I don't want this world after you. This world without you is meaningless for me. Allah,